Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kay Adam White. You can call me Kadam. Um, thank you for being the few in the crowd the last session. And I hope that this will be interesting for people. Thanks for having me today. I am here to talk about machine learning. And on the program, it says machine learning with WordPress. And we're going to be using some stuff from WordPress in a couple experiments. But unfortunately, um, I can't necessarily show you how to do all of this within WordPress. So. Um, if you're not comfortable with programming tools, I would say don't leave, but uh, the goal of this talk is mostly to try to demystify some of what's happening with what we term artificial intelligence and uh, maybe share some ways that artists are using these techniques and writers are using these techniques in um, novel ways that might not necessarily match what the companies that are investing in this technology would have expected. Um, for a little bit of background, I am a software developer at Boku. I'm usually up here talking about things like the WordPress REST API or JavaScript. And uh, machine learning is something that's, that's fairly new to me. I've gotten into it uh, in the past six months, partly because of all of the interest around it. Um, there was a, a lot of talk back in you know, January through March around this battle between Lee Siegel, one of the top Go players in the world, and Google's AlphaGo artificial intelligence engine, and Go is a very, very old board game that is much more complicated than chess. It's more simple, but much deeper in many regards, and it was long considered that beating a master human player at Go was impossible for an artificial intelligence. We all heard about Deep Blue beating um, Kasparov in chess way back in the day at this point, and Go was still this holy grail out in the future. And then in this match between Lee Siegel, who's one of the top ranked players in the world, if not the top over the past couple of years, and one of the strongest players of all time, was beaten 4 to 1 in a five game series. And this doesn't mean that we have to welcome in our new machine overlords right away. It's more that we need to understand what's happening. Because what a neural network, which is the technology used in AlphaGo, is doing is not thinking for itself in the manner that we think of thinking. It's more pattern recognition. We're going to get into what this means, but a neural network can only recognize and can only um, act upon the input that it is given. And humans are the ones training these things with all of the pros and cons that that entails. You can take a neural network and you can use it for something very complex and very cerebral, um, like creating a machine that can intuitively play the game of Go or you can use it to do slightly more anarchic, strange things. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. So I've been reading a lot about this. Wired had a cover article about machine learning a month or so back. And I still wasn't really understanding how these systems worked. They're kind of opaque. They're black boxes. And I was really lucky that my company runs OpenViz, a conference on data visualization, um, actually, uh, Amanda from White Coat Captioning captions that event as well. So a brief moment to recognize the awesomeness of the transcription team that's been working on this event. I think it's really awesome that we're are doing this more, and I hope that we continue to. So thank you. And um, the keynote for this event was uh, by Martin Wattenberg and Fernando Villegas from Google Research about how you visualize machine learning, how you understand what it is that's going inside that black box, both as a way to make it more accessible and as a way to maybe allow even the experts more insight into what's going on. And the very next talk after that at OpenBiz was by the artist Kyle McDonald about artistic applications of machine learning in his own work and the work of others. And those two talks spurred me on to start investigating this field and uh, subsequently have been to an event in New York called Alt-AI at the School of Poetic Computation. And Really, what we're doing here is I am regurgitating a lot of what I've learned over the past three to six months about artificial intelligence and neural networks and trying to share it with this room to maybe get some folks interested in uh, taking the plunge and trying to learn how to use these techniques and these tools yourselves, whether you are a writer or a programmer or somewhere in between. And, uh, this notion of artificial intelligence as an artistic interface is very strongly informed by a website called Machine Learning for Artists. I have the link for this at the end of my slides as well, but this is a book in progress by Gene Kogan of NYU's ITP program on techniques that artists can use using machine learning. And 
and uh, some of the various different ways that those things can go together. So between this and uh, this resource and various slides script from uh, Martin Wachenberg and Fernando Villegas' talk, uh, that's a good portion of the content that I've been munging together to share with you today. So with the intro out of the way, let's start at the beginning. What is a machine network, a neural network, I'm sorry? It's not intelligence. I've said that it's kind of pattern recognition. We use it a lot for things like image classification, one of the most widespread applications of neural networks that uh, is commonly something that we run across is going to be image categorization. It's actually very similar to what we do when we get this new type of image captcha where we have to go on and select all the images that have candy or that have house numbers. Um, ironically, all of these little feats of human manual labor we do to get into sites that are premised on these being problems that are hard for computers to solve, recapture Google's system uh, feeds back into their research team and they continue to use our input on captchas to make their tools for breaking captchas better. So there's this kind of weird arms race between uh, systems that you're not supposed to be able to solve with artificial intelligence and systems that actually can be. Um, and the way this works, to take an example from Golan Levin's lab at Carnegie Mellon, it's a project called Terra Pattern, you can build a system that is capable of recognizing similarities. And this can be done to pick all the images that have candy, or it can be done maybe with map imagery to say, let me click on a baseball diamond, and the system will then find all the other baseball diamonds in that area. And this can be used for a whole bunch of different types of research and even um, defense and economic purposes, there's a lot of value in being able to take a large set of image data, which has traditionally been inscrutable to computers, and feed it in in such a way that you can get information and analytics out of those images in a very information-dense way. It's also been consumerized. All of these tools for facial recognition, for example, Lightroom and iPhoto and Apple Photo and Facebook, they all have the ability to find or tag people in your photographs, a lot of that, I won't say all because I'm not 100% sure of the mechanisms all the tools use, but a lot of that is built around neural network based image recognition APIs. And uh, this is an area that I think there is potentially a lot of room for us to apply things within the web development community because these are being released as interfaces that we can tie into from our programs. And so, I was chatting with some folks yesterday about what would it look like if we built a WordPress theme that was able to auto-crop your images and detect your face so that you don't have the auto-crops where you're sort of halfway off the screen. Or um, what if you can auto-summarize your text? These are things that are technically possible and I think we're right at the beginning of the period where we'll start to see these applied more and more on web development applications. So that's some of the things that a neural network can do, but what is it? What is it that lets this really obscure system make these categorizations in such a reliable way. So to think through how one works, let's do a classification exercise ourselves. Let's try to think through step by step what we have to do to say, take this grid where we have an x, y, just on a chart, two points, a and b. If we add another one, we intuitively can see that that point c is closer to a than it is to b, so we might group them together. This type of grouping we could write an equation to do it, we could use trigonometry or something, but uh, it would end up being very specialized, very special case. If we had more complex data, for example, go white, red, white wine and red wine, if we wanted to map those out on the matrix of their chloride content to their sulfur dioxide content to key parts of the chemicals that make up wine, and you wanted to train a computer to be able to distinguish them, Doing this in a purely trigonometric, purely mathematical way is going to be difficult because how do you you could come up I'm sorry you could come up with a line that divides them approximately, but that's going to be a lot of manual labor and it's going to be a very special case. I'm not going to be able to take this same grid and apply it to other types of beverage or other types of chemical. And the premise of a neural network is that just going to this grid and saying is it closer to one or the other is an overly complex question, and we can break that down into smaller types of facets, what we call features. For example, where is a point on the horizontal x-axis, and where is a point on the vertical y-axis? And what a neural network is, it's taking a bunch of those individual little questions, 
these tiny pieces of software that are able to answer one very specific thing about an image or a piece of data. And then it's creating a network of those where you can feed these features, what we, these little one question pieces that we call neurons, and you can feed them together and build a system whereby you can tell a computer, all right, you know where something is on the XY space, you know where something is on the, you know, on the X space, you know where something is on the Y space. How can you combine these two things to find an appropriate dividing line and develop an appropriate categorization? And it's possible to automate this. You don't have to sit there tweaking things manually until you get the right system. You can actually go in and say, here's my um, particular data, my use case, and here's some information that I know to be correct. I know this is a white line, I know this is a red line. Here's how to detect something, it's X feature, here's how to detect it's Y feature, and then you iterate. You have an algorithm that is able to feed back in on itself and progressively get closer and closer and closer and, and evaluate its output until it is able to properly map between the two sets in an optimal way. And this is a very simple neural network with two features, but if you have a more complex data set, you can add in more layers and more features. This is all uh, playground.tensorflow.org, TensorFlow's Google's neural network system that they've released. And the more complex network you have, the more complex questions you can answer, and the better you can subdivide information. And the important thing about this is that we're thinking about this so far in X, Y, two-dimensional space, but space is arbitrary. These features can be used to analyze anything about an image. And so if you were categorizing handwritten numbers, you could look at each individual pixel of that image as its own feature, and the system still works. It actually is able to work in a very abstract way with no technical knowledge, no specialist input around how that, um, how that data set should be interpreted. It's able to, through the training processes that have been developed over the past couple of years, come to its own conclusions to a certain extent. And so, because this is trained on a certain set of output data, there's also limitations to it. Uh, for example, this system would assume that pure sulfur dioxide was definitely white wine, whereas I think that we all probably would agree that it was poison gas. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the way that we train neural networks, and it's important to know when you're applying one of these tools to a problem domain to which it doesn't necessarily map. And that, again, comes down to the fact that all of the input that we're using to train these things are, are frequently stuff that's sourced through Mechanical Turk or crowd processes like reCAPTCHA. Every neural network is founded upon a very, very nuanced human classification at the minute. And um, learning to understand if you're seeing strange results in a system, learning to understand where that input came from, and as writers and artists, how we can build and leverage systems that use input that is important to us, that's where a lot of my own interest in this comes. And to answer that sort of so what question, what does all of this image categorization have to do with writing art or WordPress, um, we can start looking at some applications of this for artistic ends. One really cool one um, that I'm not gonna demo, but that I encourage you to check out is called Weckinator. Uh, Weckinator is an open source application which can be used to train through machine learning processes connections between an input like your webcam and an output like maybe a musical drum machine. So if I have a MIDI drum machine on my computer that I can normally play with a little controller, um, I could train it so that if I hold my hand here, then that's a kick drum. And if I move my hand over here, that's a snare. And you can start to build up this almost sort of digital theremin um, that is all using these networks under the hood but it's applying them to something very different than should this person see an ad for Toyota on Facebook or is this a photo of Jared or a photo of Emily. And Weckinator is a tool by uh, Becca Fabrick, who spoke about it at the Alt AI event I mentioned earlier at the School for Product Computation. But she actually has a cadenze course, or at, some, at least someone, I believe it's her, has a cadenze course on machine learning for artists and musicians. Cadenze is a website that does, uh, I believe, by default, free courses on various sort of technological artistic applications. So I would encourage you to check that out if you're interested in sort of the musical, audio-visual side of applications of AI. 
And to get into the, the stuff that's not necessarily musical, but that is more interesting to me, a brief digression. I'm a big music fan. I was really excited to see all of this stuff from Wackenator, the different types of drum machine, the different types of sequencer. I've also always been a really big rock music fan. And I remember very specifically learning about Led Zeppelin the day that I heard them for the first time because I was extremely underwhelmed because my friend who had come over to share with me this transcendent experience he had with his first Led Zeppelin record made the mistake of playing Jimi Hendrix for me first. And after that, everything else was going to be kind of passe. And <laughs> I continue to listen to Jimi Hendrix and other artists that have followed in his wake who are extremely well versed in using feedback in their music. And feedback is a really interesting property of systems where you can start to let a system wrap in on itself again in a way that creates something that you may never have heard or seen before, but that pushes that field further and pushes that medium into a new space. And last summer, I saw a new type of feedback system that I had never encountered before when Google released their Deep Dream software. And who's seen or, or heard of Deep Dream before? A couple of hands. It is an um, application of Google's image recognition software, but instead of simply saying, is this a puppy, or is this a spider, or is this a baby, it takes random noise, that random pattern of images, and an interesting, an interesting property of any categorization system is that if you're saying, is this a baby, what you're saying is, I've defined a possibility space that includes baby and spider and dog. Where in that space is this? If you know where something is in space, you know what it's closest to. And Deep Dream is a feedback system that takes random image noise and tries to, in that old sci-fi way, enhance the image to look more like what their convolutional neural network thinks it should be. And as this goes forward, that random noise begins to take some shape, begins to coalesce, and you move first into these kind of abstract geometric eyes, and over time, I'm going to jump forward, images start to emerge from that noise. And you get dog faces, because there's a lot of dogs in the input text in the input photo set. If this had been a photo set that was primarily trained on cats, you might have a more feline aspect than you do now. And things don't stop there, because the more defined things get, it's still asking that question on a very, very micro level, every iteration, what does this look most like? And you start to get these really terrifying spider, puppy, slug animals coming out of chaos. And this, uh, this video actually has some like, really weird psychedelic music on top that I recommend watching it alone in a dark room late at night. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really interesting to me. I'm really interested in this ability not simply to ask questions of the real world with a neural network, but to actually use this same technology to make something new and to make things that we have not seen before. slugs for now. And uh, one potentially more comfortable application of this is style transfer, which has really exploded in the, in the past week or two specifically, which I'll get into on the next slide, but uh, this was research by Gene Kogan um, around how to take a style transfer process that was defined in an academic paper and then just play with it, start saying what would happen if you took as your input source a Google Maps image and you mapped it onto the Mona Lisa. It's still recognizable, but also you start seeing like those eyes become those little data point things, the little flags that you drop on Google Maps, and then you can take hieroglyphics and the characters end up doing that contour. There's ways that you can use these systems to take any arbitrary image and convert it into something um, that is recognizable, but has aspects of both individual categories. And uh, I'm going to real fast try to demo. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there. Mel Choice, who was on the panel yesterday, posting, as we learned this morning, she's, she's quite good at, at selfies, but she was posting something on uh, 
Instagram where you can take a picture, and this app Prisma does this exact same thing, where you can take an arbitrary input image that you've taken with your phone, and I think this is iPhone early only right now, but I think they're working on an Android version, and then it actually sends it out to their servers, and it runs it through one of these neural network processes, and you get something that takes your own input image, but then maps some arbitrary artistic style onto it. And this is the first application of this I've seen, certainly on an App Store type space, but I seriously doubt it's going to be last. This is based on open source tools and open source software, and uh, I think that it's going to be the beginning of a lot more that will come after it. For example, you can do this on video. Gene Kogan's also been experimenting around how you apply this process over time and not just on a static image so that you can take a rotating disco ball and make it look like a glimpse painting, or potentially also slightly creepy at times, but very cool, you can take various different artworks and apply them onto Alice in Wonderland to get these really interesting kind of melanges of artistic style in motion, in an animation. So this goes through, this goes through a number of different artists as the input image, and they all kind of map and transform on top of the original animation. And this isn't limited to images. The piece of it that I've been experimenting with the most is actually text, using, instead of a convolutional neural network, which is good at making decisions about what's in an image, a recurrent neural network analyzes an arbitrary sequence. And text is a sequence of characters. So you can use a recurrent neural network to look at an input text, for example, Shakespeare. And you can train it on this input text and then sample it. The same way that Deep Dream can simply take arbitrary noise and come up with an image of something out of it. If I have a neural network that understands the basic character sequences of Shakespeare, it has contained within it the ability to output text in that style. So you can take the input text, train a model, and then sample that model and get out text that is not in the Shakespeare corpus, but is close to that style. And um, this works with basically any sample input and output. If you have a bunch of text, and you need a lot of text for it to be reliable, you can run it through this process, and then you can have a model that you can use over and over again. And the training is expensive. The training requires a lot of computation, but the sampling is very quick. And that's why we can do something like this image transfer with a quick up and down to their server. Whereas before, actually, a lot of these techniques have been around for years and years and years. Some of this research goes back to the 70s, but it was considered kind of academic and like a toy project because we didn't have computers powerful enough to do it readily at hand. Whereas now, this runs on OS X and Linux just fine with no added, um, no added software beyond a couple things you need to download if you're not proficient with command line, it can take a little bit of time to get up and running, but once you are up and running, you can basically copy and paste a couple's commands and uh, start working with these types of text generation without really having to understand what's going on under the hood. And if you're local and are interested in this but intimidated by the setup process, let me know and grab a coffee and set it up sometime. Um, as a quick aside, if you have or your spouse or child or parent has a gaming PC, Graphics cards are extremely good at doing intense scientific computation. They are, for more than just playing Call of Duty at maximum <laughs> settings, you can actually use them to make this type of training process really fast. So if you have or have been thinking about building a gaming computer, I suggest uh, using an NVIDIA card and starting to look at some of the things you can do with this from a machine learning perspective. And this is where I've been spending most of my time, is saying, like, let's take some arbitrary input text. For example, if there's any Pokemon Go fans in the room, you can take the Pokedex, <laughs> which is about half a megabyte of text, and you can let the computer hallucinate over that text to get random text back out. And so we have these descriptions of hypothetical Pokemon, for example, one that is into a magnet and has enemies. Um, there's times where the output actually ends up rhyming completely by random. Uh, it ends up being kind of poetic, and there's a number of poets that are interested in new, poet new poetic interfaces and new ways of composition that work back and forth between the human poet and the computer output. And some of them are using neural networks, some of them are using other generation techniques. 
but it's an area of uh, poetry specifically and art in general that I'm really excited in seeing to continue to grow and evolve because you can take an input text, for example, I don't know if anyone saw Brian's talk earlier in the afternoon, but you can take something like poststatus.com, which is a great blog, and you can feed it into a neural network. He let me download his entire back catalog through the WordPress API, and um, then uh, we can just start getting text out that talks about WordPress. We can get things that mention the comments on other WordPress publications. They talk about small components and plugins. <laughs> and uh, we can also start to answer and to ask questions about it. So I could say, you can see that with text and you can start to get questions out. Does it work? That's because the text is really good. The future of WordPress is in performance for users. I think that's actually pretty accurate. It's completely random. but. And if, uh, if you are into podcasting, you could just take this and pipe it directly into audio and start saying, like, you know, maybe we don't. Ah, the project has been in a big lead by the WordPress core assets with people. Okay, maybe we're a little bit ahead of the game if we try to do podcasts. We might want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming back to AlphaGo and coming back to kind of all of the journalism about artificial intelligence that's occurred recently, the uh, Wired headline about it was the end of we won't program computers in the future, we will train them. And there's a lot of uncertainty and doubt around these tools. Researchers are finding ways to combine neural networks together in fashions that defy what we thought was possible and let us solve problems that we thought were beyond computation. And as artists and poets, we've always been really good at taking one tool that's used for something specific and using it for something completely alternative in an interesting way. And so as researchers get better at building these systems, we get more and more tools that we can use to take them in new directions. And the reason that I'm giving this talk at a WordPress event is that one of the threads of conversation that has come up around artificial intelligence isn't scare tactics. It isn't saying this is going to change the way we live, although it is very slowly because our computers are getting better and better at matching us to things that we might need. But it's because as individuals that are beholden to these systems in our daily lives, the more we understand them and the more that we learn to leverage them ourselves, the more diverse the community of input and research and hypothesis around them becomes. There was a big news story a while back around image facial recognition, pointing out that if you have a facial recognition API that's only been trained on white Caucasian faces. It miscategorizes black, Latino, Hispanic, etc. And that's really bad. We need to do better. We need all of the systems that companies in Silicon Valley are building to be able to properly map onto local communities and around the world. And the more people that are involved in that, the more diverse the audience that understands that this is just another computer technology, and that technology can applied across a broad spectrum of uses by a broad spectrum of people. The more diversity we have there, the stronger artificial intelligence research, the stronger the tools that we can build with it become. And that's what interests me the most. That's what makes me want to continue learning how to do this, and that's what makes me really excited that artists are beginning to leverage it for their and our own purposes. And that is what I want to share with you.
for a neural network doesn't learn language, it simply learns average character sequences, it's possible that it will create garbage words. And there's tools out there that will spell check, that will groom your data, and that will let you identify subsets of it that are more linguistically viable, and then you can service those to a user. So I did this process with Wired.com headlines over the past couple of years, uh, following the day of rest event in London in January, and um, we, I, I did map it through one of these cleanup services, and it helps a little bit, but I think we could go even farther, and we could get maybe a writer's block button in WordPress to say, I don't know what to write, click. Oh, crabs are eating sandwiches in Spain, that sounds like a good thing to start with. You know, like something that at least makes grammatical sense, if not semantic sense. So it's, it's definitely possible. All right, I'm going to talk about feedback, about training the network. There are now. So if you tell it, So the, the, the comment was that Jared's question might have been more around, is it possible to positively reinforce right. the network? And yes, there are ways that you could say with other systems, I don't know if it's possible with this one that I've been using myself, because that was simply the first one I landed on and it's what I've been running with. But the way the image categorization, for example, works is that it goes in with a large set of sample data that is, as I mentioned, labeled by humans as this is this, this is that, and the network feeds back on itself enough times that it begins to learn what is a false positive and what is a true positive. In text, I think that's possible, but I don't know if it's possible with the particular library that I shared in this talk for during it. I've been working on a prototype robot that that's named Baxter. I don't know what it's called, but Baxter. Can you use the mic? I'm just having a little bit of trouble hearing you, sorry. Can you, can you hear me now? Very well, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I've been working on a prototype robot, it's Baxter, and I'm uh, giving the deliveries to Chinese manufacturers for their packaging and labeling. We have been using iOS robots operating system for that, and it's all about the neural networks we need to train the pattern and things like that. I put the different sensors onto it. One is for the face recognition, and the other one is uh, for the OCI, just to spell it, uh, read something. When it comes to a situation that a man has wearing a shirt with something onto it, then the both sensors get activated and it's, it, it conflicts all the things. So can you suggest me a better neural network API if something is available in open source so that I can uh, make the distinctions that which has a better priority, uh, either the face recognition or the OCR tool? Uh, so I, I just need suggestions and I'll be good to explore some APIs. That's a really interesting question. I don't, unfortunately, have a suggestion off the top of my head, but I would say that from a logical perspective, it probably makes sense in whatever code takes those two APIs and combines them to figure out which one you want to prioritize first, potentially facial first. But um, I don't know of a single neural network that is trained for both of those use cases yet. I would, I would suggest looking through. There's a, a I believe that there's an open source catalog of neural networks, it's something called Model Zoo, that may not suit your use case, but might be worth looking at because it might be used. Oh, well, it was uh, Model Zoo, you're absolutely right, because I contacted the manufacturers of Baxter and they told me that you should explore the Model Zoo, but th th there is some more deficiencies in Model Zoo which does not allow me. Uh, there are some other things, like I, I cannot use the Model Zoo. Uh, my environment does not allow me, and the people at home, I said, the Baxter training chips, so they do not even allow me. Uh, but, case, yeah, that's yeah, but I'm, look, I'm trying to find out some more, but I tried to contact the manufacturer, but all the time they told me, okay, if you get a better one, do let us know, and we are good to incorporate in ROS. So I thought maybe, but uh, I'm going to take your contact information, and it might bother you some way later. I'm from Pakistan, so I might send you a couple of emails. Uh, if I be stuck on this thing. But that's something, some ironic issue I've been on this since last six months. Sure, I'd love to talk. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I am not an expert in this system. This talk could have been subtitled, Things Cat Up Thinks is Cool. But um, <laughs> I'd certainly do love to talk with you more about it. And uh, thanks. Hi, great talk. Um, I actually, you mentioned uh, facial recognition for WordPress, and I actually wanted to let you know there is actually a plugin. It doesn't do it automatically, it's called My Eyes Are Up Here. And it has, it, it, it has a show to automatically detect faces, although I, it doesn't work that great, but then you can, 
instead manually hit the hotspot. So it doesn't run automatically on your images, but it integrates right into the media library. That is and brilliant. I've actually started installing it on a lot of sites because it's very helpful. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know about that. Any other questions? Thank you all for your time. Cool.